In a previous lesson, we talked about the discovery of P-52 and the role that F.C. Bauer had in how people viewed the date of John's Gospel until P-52 was discovered. Now I want to talk about Konstantin von Tischendorf, another German scholar. Tischendorf was born in 1815 and died in 1874. He was the par excellence textual critic of the 19th century, and many would consider, many would consider him to be the finest uh, New Testament textual critic who has ever lived. Tischendorf was especially motivated in his career to counter the arguments of F.C. Bauer in his view of the dates of the New Testament books and uh, that uh, the copies of the New Testament that we had must be terribly corrupt and so we can't possibly get back to what the original text said. So Tischendorf set out as one of his major goals in life to discover earlier manuscripts that would bring us much closer to the date of the original text of the New Testament. In 1844, he visited a monastery in uh, Egypt that was unknown to Western Europeans. It's St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of Mount Sinai in Egypt. This happens to be the oldest continuously inhabited monastery in the world. Built in the first half of the sixth century by Emperor Justinian, this monastery has never been vacated and it has never had any major catastrophes to it, which makes it extremely significant. It took Tischendorf two weeks to get there by camel from Cairo in the middle of the winter in 1844. And uh, when he finally showed up, he wanted to get into the monastery, but in order to get into the monastery, he had to be raised up uh, through an opening about 25 feet off the ground on the side of the monastery. There was no other access in. This was uh, very high walls that were keeping marauders out. And uh, Tischendorf was, uh, he came with a letter of recommendation and was able to get into the monastery and spent about a week there uh, looking at their manuscripts. What he tells us is that what he noticed the scribes or these monks were doing was actually uh, ripping leaves out of an ancient manuscript, an ancient codex, and putting those leaves into the fire as kindling to keep themselves warm during the winter months. And in Tischendorf's story, uh, as he uh, relays this, he's, he was uh, horrified at this. He told them that this was an extremely valuable manuscript and was able to rescue most of it or, or the, the remaining leaves of it at least, and then get those leaves published as part of an Old Testament. At the University of Leipzig is where he got this published. And consequently, Tischendorf was able to rescue this ancient manuscript of the Greek text of the Old Testament. Now, it had the prophets in it, the uh, leaves that uh, Leipzig published, but it didn't have earlier texts from the Old Testament. And the amazing thing is, that uh, Tischendorf relays this story. I think he relayed the story so his mission would look more like a rescue mission than a theft, if you will. Uh, at the same time, I'm not so sure that Tischendorf was a thief, but uh, I'll tell you the rest of the story as, as we go through this. He came back to the monastery a few years later and was disappointed that they were not uh, so willing to talk to him and help him find other manuscripts. But then he made a third trip to St. Catherine's Monastery in 1859. And on this visit, before he left, the last night there, one of the monks brought to him uh, the rest of this codex. And uh, it was wrapped in a, a purple cloth, and he stayed up all night in his cell reading the Greek text of this codex, which was fabulous. It ended up being a manuscript from the 4th century, and the significant thing about it, this Codex Sinaiticus is what it is now called, is that this manuscript is the oldest complete New Testament in any language in the world. It's from the fourth century, about the middle of the fourth century, and right now it is housed at the British Library, prominently displayed in a room right next to another famous manuscript, Codex Alexandrinus. Now, how it got to the British Library is a fascinating tale in itself. Tischendorf brought this manuscript back to Russia, and the Tsar, through some intrigue and some things that are not exactly clear to us in the aftermath of this event 150 years later, was able to secure this manuscript from the monks of Sinai, and they got a new archbishop. Now, 
since that time, the, uh, the monks and priests at Mount Sinai have said, this manuscript belongs to us. It needs to come back to St. Catherine's Monastery. But uh, the Western world has looked at this and said, no, you were not taking care of this manuscript properly, and it was a good thing that Tischendorf rescued it. However, there's more to this story. Tischendorf left a note with them that said, I am just borrowing this manuscript. I'll bring it back whenever you want me to. He wanted to uh, borrow it and take it to St. Petersburg so it could be photographed. And uh, they uh, have asked for it back, but uh, apparently that note is not a well-known note to others. And it wasn't necessarily regarded as uh, officially representing the Russian government. Well, several years later, after the Bolshevik Revolution, and we have a new communist government in Russia, this new government needed funds. It was uh, uh, right in the middle of the Great Depression, and consequently they uh, had to raise some money, and they decided, we've got some relics here, some religious relics in particular, that we'd like to sell off to some other countries so that we can uh, get some money for our government. So they decided to sell Codex Sinaiticus, and they offered the world the price of 100,000 pounds for this manuscript. If someone would pay 100,000 pounds, that uh, person or institute or government would own the manuscript. As it turned out, it was the British government who came up with the money, mostly by asking its citizens for the money, and many of those citizens asked American cousins for money because they had a little bit more than the British citizens, so it was kind of a collaborative effort be between individuals in two different nations, and that manuscript now is housed at the British Library. It made it to England on Christmas Day, 1933, and it has been at the British Library ever since. But here's the rest of the story. In 1975, there was a discovery of a Geniza, or a storeroom, at St. Catherine's Monastery. One of the kitchens had a fire in it, and when they finally put the, fl uh, the fire out, they looked between the floorboards, and they noticed that underneath the floorboards was this storeroom that had many, many manuscripts in it. When they finally noticed what was down there, they thought, where did this storeroom come from? When did people put manuscripts in here? And what access did they have to it? They had to create a door in the wall. They got into the storeroom and what they discovered was hundreds of manuscripts. After 24 years of examining these documents and cataloging them with the uh, Ministry of uh, Culture in Athens and a catalog came out in 1999, finally they were able to produce this catalog and it listed over 12 hundred manuscripts that had been discovered in this Geniza, along with 50,000 fragments of manuscripts that they have not cataloged because it's too difficult to. But among those manuscripts were several leaves and parts of leaves of Codex Sinaiticus. Now what's significant here is this, that Codex Sinaiticus with Tischendorf's Old Testament text had the later books of the Old Testament in it, but it didn't have the earliest books. It didn't have the Pentateuch in it. And according to his story, they were ripping out leaves, uh, probably in sequence, going right through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, on down through the Old Testament, and putting those leaves into the fire. But what was discovered in this Geniza were leaves from the Pentateuch, from the first five books of the Old Testament. That tells us that most likely they were not ripping these leaves out and putting them in the fire, but instead, here's a book that had, uh, it was a codex, and consequently the binding uh, had uh, gotten loose, and the leaves on the outside of any codex, as anyone knows who has a paperback book that's worn out and has been used for a long time, those outside leaves start falling off. They didn't know what manuscript they belonged to, but they were not willing to throw them away. They were not willing to burn them, so they put those leaves with a bunch of other leaves and a bunch of other uh, fragmentary manuscripts and uh, uh, discarded manuscripts. They put them into the storeroom. They were not in the practice of burning leaves of manuscripts. Now, a question is raised, at what time in history were they doing this? The most recent manuscript in the Skeniza was from the 18th century. So it was the modus operandi of these monks and priests to do this sort of a thing very close to the time when Tischendorf would come uh, several decades later. But it wasn't as if they had changed how they were handling manuscripts a hundred years later and decided now what we're going to do is uh, burn these manuscripts when they had not been doing that earlier. This is evidence that scholars are not fully aware of yet, although those early leaves have now been published and they are online at uh, 
uh, a website that has all parts of Codex Sinaiticus, including the parts that are at the British Library, those few leaves that are at St. Petersburg, those at Leipzig, and the remaining leaves that are at St. Catherine's Monastery. So here's this discovery of this great manuscript, one of the most important manuscripts of the New Testament from the fourth century, the earliest complete New Testament manuscript by over 500 years. And yet we still have intrigue and mystery as to how it got out of St. Catherine's and whether the monks of Sinai own this manuscript or whether the British Library really owns it.